So what does John 1 tell us? It tells us that nothing came into existence apart from God, apart from the word, which would be Jesus. So what is uh, Colossians 1, 16 and 17? Everything that was created was created in him. So here's the question. If you have a concept of hell, and and I I believe in, this is, I believe in hell, I just don't believe in eternal conscious torment. And uh, so let's take a step back. If you believe in a place eternal that has eternal conscious torment, is is that a created thing or an uncreated thing? That would be my first question. And 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 does it lie outside the cosmos that was created in Christ? Right? Those are really fundamental questions. So if you say, well, it's a created thing, then it must be fundamentally good because God is good and God creates good. And therefore, it must be in Christ because nothing came into existence apart from him. So if it is a created thing, it's a reality within Christ. And so there's there can't be separation. If it's an uncreated thing, it has to be the very nature of God. Because God is the only uncreated. Right? Can you think of another way to look at it in terms of, of whether it's created or uncreated? So if it's uncreated, it is the nature of God. So therefore, there is no separation. If it's created, it was created in Christ. Therefore, there's no separation. In Colossians, everything that came into existence was created in him, is now sustained, held together in him, for him, through him, by him. Right? So, so that's a dilemma. And if you have eternal conscious torment, and I think you're referring to like the great divorce, um, where you seem to have a sense of separation. And um, I think Lewis was on a journey because he was so influenced by George MacDonald, who held to no separation, that separation was a illusion of the highest magnitude, the idea of separation. There's alienation. That means within Christ, I can turn my face away and experience the result of that. But it's not separation. It's alienation. I'm constantly held within the relentless embrace of love, whether I receive it, accept it, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, McDonald was the greatest mentor for C.S. Lewis. In fact, when C.S. Lewis read Fantasties, he then said, my, my mind was baptized and it took the rest of me 18 years to catch up. And then he said, from that point on, I never wrote anything that George MacDonald wasn't in, right? Even in The Great Divorce, there's a Scotsman. And in the preface that C.S. Lewis, the introduction, he says, that's George MacDonald is the Scotsman, right? So I think that C.S. Lewis had moved in his perspective by the time he wrote The Last Battle in the Narnia series, because that's not it's not the same vision as in the great divorce. So I think Lewis contradicted himself and uh, which is so funny because he is sort of an icon of Western evangelical fundamentalism, but it's like, have you not read Lewis? You know, um, do you not understand what he's saying? Because it's quite contradictory to a lot of the tenets that, that my people held and that I grew up with. So back to the issue of hell. What is it, right? For whatever it is, if it's created, it is created in Christ and it is good. But that's where there's a problem. For God to keep alive forever human beings with no possibility of redemption, eternally, that has some real major issues. For example... That means, I mean, what do you do with babies? What do you do with mentally ill people? What do you do with people who've never heard? You know, it, it's, those are questions. But even if you uh, posited eternal conscious torment as a place that God keeps in existence in order to torment, and uh, it's like one person in hell then would eventually, because it's eternal, would eventually experience more tragedy, loss, trauma, 
and torment than, than the entire human race has experienced up to this point. Because up to this point, we're dealing with a finite piece of time, but inside of that kind of hell, you're dealing with eternal, right? There is no final point in time. And it's like, oh, so what do you do with statement like Samuel that says, God does not take away life, but always looks for a way that the banished one will be restored, right? Samuel 14, 14. And other passages like that. One is that we run into a problem because we have literalized scripture and ignored the word of God. And the word of God is Jesus, right? If you're, go if you're going to try to understand scripture, you better look through the lens of the character and nature of Jesus. And when you look at Jesus, you see the father. He is the revelation of God. And that puts us into sort of a bind with our literalistic ways of looking at scripture, what we call particularly the Old Testament, because there seems to be massive disagreements here between Paul and Moses, between um, Samuel and the Chronicles. And, you know, one will say that God did this, one will say that Satan did this, exactly talking about the same event. And our problem is that we don't, when we introduce the inerrancy and infallibility of scripture, we, we did a massive, it was a massive tragedy because now it, it didn't, it wasn't the spirit who would teach us the meaning of the word of God, who is Jesus. It was experts and it was theologically trained experts and they were in constant disagreement with each other, these experts, but they're the ones that held the truth on our behalf and you couldn't trust subjectivity like the Holy Spirit. So in my denomination, by the end of the, you know, our view was at the end of the first century, the Holy Spirit basically quit and was replaced by the Holy Bible eventually. And, um, and so, you know, what do we do with hell? That's a really great question. And for me, it's got to be um, the reality of love in some form. So, and this is, this is an agreement with scripture. What if the purpose of hell is the, the love of God is a fiery fury that is opposed to everything in me that is not of love's kind. And that is what, that is what God is out to destroy. Not out to destroy me, but out to destroy everything in me that is not of love's kind. Everybody gets salted with fire and salt and fire are purification. You know, salt is a, is a purifying agent and it's that which you know, keep something in existence, but uh, fire is a purifying agent. So that means that fire then is in accordance with the character of God who is love, not punitive or retributive. And the, the term judgment then is like the early church who saw judgment, not in a forensic sense, not in a legal sense, not like, you know, you come to the courtroom and God is the judge at the He's got, he's judging you according to what? According to the law. He may love you, but he has to punish you, right? Because he's under the law. And in that scenario, the law is actually greater than God because God has to submit to the law. It's like the nature of God that is love is not the primary here. And that comes out of our Western tradition. You know, Augustine was a lawyer. Calvin was a lawyer. Luther was a lawyer. We have a whole bunch of lawyers in our history. And they created a forensic model. And that forensic model had God the Father on the judgment seat. You had Jesus as a defense attorney if you paid him. And how do you pay him? You pay him by praying the sinner's prayer. And then you continue to pay him by fasting and praying and giving money and all these other things. But you pray the sinner's prayer. And then that's his payment. And now he then says, okay, I am going to take the punishment of God the Father, who is under the law. I'm going to take that punishment on behalf of you in your stead. I mean, that's the way that I was taught, right? What's punishment? Well, it's eternal conscious torment. When did Jesus pay that punishment? When did he do it? Like, 
He was killed by us, not by God the Father, according to Scripture. And then he, what does he do? Go into eternal conscious torment? No, he goes into the place of dead and wreaks havoc. Saturday was not a quiet day in terms of Scripture. You know, he goes down there and leads captivity captive. He raids the place. What, what is that? That's the punishment of eternal conscious torment? Or, you know, is that something Jesus is yet to undergo? Is he? Because that's our punishment, according to the idea of, of hell being a, uh, eternal conscious torment. So what did the early church do? They didn't have a forensic model. They had a doctor hospital model. That God is the judge, like a doctor. He is the doctor. And, and we get our Hippocratic oath, you know, do no harm, we'll do no harm. It comes from holding up the snake in the, you know, the, in the serpent in the wilderness who becomes a type of Jesus. And, and that is to redeem the snake that is represented in the garden as the accusation against God. Now the snake represents the healing of God. So what does a doctor do? Does he judge you? I hope so. Right? If I go see a doctor, I want him to judge me. I want him to say, Paul, your arm's broken. Or Paul, you have epilepsy, which I do. Right? I want him to then, what's his punishment? We're going to have to put a cast on your arm for a month. We're going to have to give you some anti-seizure medication. What's the goal of that punishment? Healing. That you would be made whole. See, that model makes sense according to the nature and character of God. And there's a lot of other things about the, the view of hell that we have that are a problem, right? Like we came up with uh, the age of accountability, right? We, we picked 12. Why did we pick 12? Well, we think that uh, Isaac was 12 when he was sacrificed on, you know, almost sacrificed on the mountain. Uh, he wasn't, but we, we think that he was. And we also think that, that, uh, Jesus, well, we know Jesus was 12 when he was, you know, stayed in Jerusalem and uh, seemed to disobey his parents, but he was, he was involved in his relationship with his father, who is God. So, but why, I mean, it's just totally arbitrary. What happens to someone who's 12 years and a day? Do you start counting 12 from the moment of conception or from the moment of birth? I mean, like, how complex does this have to get? Uh, how about those who've never heard? Well, we, go, we quote Romans 1 and we go like, oh, okay, they get judged according to the light that they have received. That's one of the things that we say. So is that easier or harder, right? And well, it seems to be easier. It's like the bar is set lower, right? So here's the question. Why are we telling them about Jesus? I mean, they've got an easier way in than to, you know, pray the sinner's prayer. All they have to do is look at nature and go like, there must be a God who loves. There, look at the creation is good, right? And uh, so why evangelism? It seems like here's the good news. Now we set the bar higher and um, now you've got to ask Jesus into your heart or whatever. What do we do with babies? Do they get a free pass to heaven or do they enter eternal conscious torment? Well, that's why we came up with the age accountability because we couldn't deal if we had kids ourselves, we couldn't deal with the issue of, of sending our babies to eternal conscious torment. So what about those who are mentally ill and cannot put a sentence together? Do they get a free pass or do they? And here's where part of our history is that we believed everybody was had a sin nature. And so it's the sin nature that needs to be punished forever. Like, how just is that? Right? You didn't hear, you were a baby, you were mentally impaired, but because you have a sin nature, which I don't believe anymore that you had a sin nature and um, that, you know, you have, you're made in the image of God and you have involved yourselves because of alienation and all kinds of expressions of that, that cover up the image of God. You know, you're the immortal diamond covered up with all kinds of crap rather than as as Luther said, you are snow-covered dung. So he flipped it inside out, right? He said the core of your being is that you are a piece of crap. And it's covered up by performance and works and, and or by the righteousness of Christ. But you are still a piece of crap. And I, I don't believe that at all. I think that's 
utterly a lie. So, I mean, the conversation about hell could be quite involved and lengthy, as you know. <laughs>